and we're going to see in 59 number one that development is much longer, so it's like 50% longer. And you have a longer coda as well in that, which serves as a second development area, so that's something associated with Beethoven, especially the middle period works. You also have the traditional use of double bars and repeats around the exposition in 18 number one. In 59 number one, he discards that, and so of course that also has a, uh, an effect on the, the proportions of not repeating the exposition. We talked about the terms stretto, and we talked about fugato, so you should know those two terms. So opus 18 number one featured a stretto passage. They're, they're both contrapuntal terms, so they're similar. But stretto has to do with a short subject that's presented in succession in which the entrances are overlapped. So before the subject is completely presented, another voice enters on top of it. So you have that overlapped effect. A fugato is more like a fugue where each voice enters with a complete statement of the subject, and then a second voice will answer it, and then a third voice will answer that, and so forth. So that's what we saw in 59 number 1, was a fugato passage at the end. And you should know that the 59 number 1 has extensive motivic thematic development, and that Brahms uh, first movement of Opus 120, number two, the E flat major clarinet sonata, is the same. It has that extensive motivic thematic uh, treatment. And they both don't have double bars and repeats around the exposition. So those are two things that are alike about those two movements. So that was 59, number one, Beethoven, and Opus 120, number two, Brahms. You should know about the Franck Violin Sonata, that it's a work which is cyclic. So the opening A theme of the first movement that the violin presents, that's something that returns in each movement. So it's a four movement work. First movement is a sonatina movement. So it's a very brief development area. And the third movement um, was labeled recitative fantasy by Franck. You should know what recitative and fantasy denote, what those terms reference. So what you would expect to find in a work that's labeled that way. And third movement even has a theme that comes back in the fourth movement. So lots of connections thematically. I could ask you about the texture at the beginning of the fourth movement. So that starts out in an accompanied canon. So the right hand of the piano is the leader, the violin, then duplicates that same melody of measure later in an octave higher. So that pattern is presented several times in the movement. Overall, it's a compound ternary form. And so it's a good example of just the, um, the contrapuntal um, techniques that Franck would use. So Franck was very much influenced by Bach and was a great master of counterpoint. Then you should know a um, term like Razumovsky or Richard Mulfeld. Who is Richard Mulfeld? Can you find that name? Lauren. Uh, I believe that he Brown's Opus 120 number two is written here. Mm -hmm. So Brahms actually wrote two clarinet and piano sonatas that were published as Opus 120. The one we listened to was 120 number two. But both of those were inspired by this great clarinet virtuoso. And yeah, that's who Richard Mulfeld was. Okay.
Okay, any other things that you um, couldn't find in your notes from the review questions? So if you come across something you have a question about, just email me and I'll get back with you. Okay, so we're going to now move on with our survey of great German art song. One thing I want to say about the last work that we did, which is the song cycle Venturisa by Schubert. And so that entire song cycle ends the last song, so the 24th song ends in a real pessimistic mood. And so that final song features this, this poem that describes an organ grinder. So it's this beggar who is standing barefoot on the ice. And he says his cup is always empty. And he's you know, detached from the situation. And he's grinding out these songs on his hurdy-gurdy. And um, the poet then asks, are you grinding out the songs of my life on that? And so basically he's you know, identifying with that um, despondent feeling. That's going to be in comparison then to the next song cycle that we're going to do, which is Schumann's song cycle, Dishtriba, Poet's Love, which ends with a sense of optimism. <clears throat> composer that we're looking at is Robert Schumann. And Robert Schumann is one of the great romantic composers who um, is writing in the 1830s initially. So this first generation of completely romantic composers are those composers who were born around 1810. So that's Felix Mendelssohn, Robert Schumann, Frederick Chopin, Franz Liszt, Richard Wagner. So those five composers. And Schumann is maybe you know, the most imaginative as far as just the literary element in his music. Um, the dates of his life, to 1856. He is a German composer. His father was a bookseller, and so he grew up with great literature. So he's very well read. And as I've mentioned earlier in connection with their discussion of Brahms, Schumann started a musical magazine that was very influential in the 1830s and 1840s. Continued to be important um, in the 1850s after he'd sold it. Um, and in that, he was writing articles that expressed his opinion about musical aesthetics and about up-and-coming composers and performers. So. In that, he would adopt these pseudonyms. These, he invented these imaginary characters. And so three of these um, were uh, 
the character Florestan. Eusebius was the alter ego of Florestan. So Eusebius was the dreamy introvert. So very lyrical. And then he had a third character that he sometimes would use, which was the androgynous character, Raro, which he got from the last two letters of Clara's name, his wife, and, and the first two letters of his name. And Raro was the judicious, level-headed character. So these three characters represented this band of musicians who upheld the highest standards for artistic expression. This group of composers he called the David Spoonswer, which means the League of David. So this had to do with biblical references to David and Goliath and, you know, and the, the Philistines. Um, just out of curiosity, yeah. where were Strauss and Debussy? Strauss and Debussy are later in the century. Okay. So Strauss is composer around the turn of the century, first decade of the 20th century, and Debussy was the same. Okay. So Strauss is more of a post-romantic, Debussy is an impressionist composer. Okay. So they're a little bit lighter. All right. So. <coughs> So this is the name of this group of musicians, the Dalek Speech Group. And so they were waging artistic battle against the Philistines, who were those musicians who exploited music for their own personal gain. So, he was really opposed to the idea of empty virtuosity because this was becoming really popular, just the incredible technical skills of, of some of the players and, and how popular that was with the audiences. And it led to compositions that lacked an artistic merit that were just featuring you know, the technique of the player. And so this, is, this was the big controversy. So the Philistines were those that exploited music and that Schumann and his group had the utmost contempt for. And so his wife Clara continues this, this concept. And Clara and Johannes Brahms, you know, were such good friends. And so they were in this, this more conservative camp in the second half of the 19th century. And they were in opposition to the music of the future, which is the music that Wagner wrote. He came up with that label, Music of the Future, and that Franz Liszt supported. 
And so, you know, there's a lot of discussion about this. All right, so Robert Schumann um, left home to ostensibly go to law school. And he would write letters home, you know, saying that studies were going well, but it's never been proven that he attended even one day of class. Um, so after a year or so, he then made, you know, his confession that he wanted to be a musician. He studied with a very famous piano teacher, uh, Frederick Wieck. And he moved in um, to their house. So Robert Schumann initially wanted to be a concert pianist. Of course, he was also composing, which was typical at that time. You know, composer, performer were one. And um, so he moved into the house when he was 23, and he fell in love with Frederick Wieck's daughter. He was 14, so nine years younger. This developed into this very intense a relationship and they wanted to get married and as I mentioned before the father opposed it vehemently and um, Robert Schumann was manic depressive he starts showing signs of this illness when he's a teenager had you know dissociative fugues where he would have a couple of days where he'd be totally he wouldn't remember what happened you know um, he drank a lot, um, so Frederick Wieck was able to block this um, and, and didn't allow his daughter to marry Robert. Um, but then the day she turned 21 and they got married. Anyway. So she died one year before Brahms did. She was 14 years older than Brahms, but nine years younger than Robert. So um, Clara then um, became a hugely important popular um, pianist and composer herself. In many ways, um, she was more popular than Robert was. So uh, she was so well known, you know, as this brilliant virtuoso. And they had eight children. Um, so they had, you know, really um, busy schedule. Um, the year that they got married was 1840. Robert Schumann wrote um, over 160 some odd songs in that one year. So it's known as the year of the song. So up to that point, what, what happened? Um, in the mid 1830s is that Robert damaged his right hand. So there are varying accounts of what happened. You know, the traditional account is that he injured it with this um, little device that he was trying to strengthen his fingers and that he damaged his tendons. There are others that say that, that he suffered neuro neurological damage from mercury that he was taking for uh, syphilis. But at any rate, he was unable to continue to try to be a concert piano.